Hello, I'm Lucinda Archer and this is my talk for the 2020 MemTab conference discussing methods to calculate the minimum sample size required for external validation of clinical prediction models with continuous outcomes. I just want to say a big thank you to each of my collaborators on this project. Here I'm going to save a little bit of time by assuming you all know what prediction models are and their importance in healthcare. And here we're specifically going to focus on predictions of continuous outcomes, which include basically anything measured on an unbroken scale, typically modelled using a linear regression framework. After a model's been developed, its performance can be measured in a number of different ways. The first we focus on and require precision in upon external validation is the R-squared, which gives a measure of how well the model fits the data. R-squared is essentially a measure of the correlation between the true um, observed outcomes and the predictions. We also include two measures of calibration to determine how well predictions match the observed outcome. Starting with calibration in the allotch, this is a measure of agreement between the predicted and observed outcome values on average. On a standard calibration plot, the majority of individuals lying above the diagonal implies observed values are greater than predicted, so we're generally predicting values that are too low. Correspondingly, where the majority of individuals lie below the diagonal, predicted values are larger than observed, and so our predictions are too high. The calibration slope indicates agreement between predicted and observed values across the full range of predicted values. So lower values of the C slope can indicate a wide range of predicted values compared to a narrow range of the observed values, giving predictions towards the lower end that are too low, with those at the higher end being too high. Overall, predictions are too extreme as a result of overfitting to the development data. Equally, a C slope greater than 1 indicates a narrow range of predictions relative to the observed values, so predictions are not varied enough. When external validation studies are conducted, sample size is still really important, just like in model development or any other kind of study. We've developed simple closed form solutions to estimate the minimum sample size that you need to precisely estimate all these performance statistics. And as precision in these estimates also depends on their residual variances, we also require these variances to be estimated precisely too. Firstly, in an external validation, we want to make sure that our estimate of R squared is reasonably precise. There are many options available for calculating the standard error of R squared, and we focus on an approach suggested by Wishart and recommended by Tan, who compared many different calculation methods. This one is relatively simple and yields results comparable to the more complicated options. The only numbers we need to check this criterion are an estimate of, um, are an estimate of R squared in the new data, which we recommend you base on the adjusted R squared seen in the development study, and how precise we want our estimation of R squared to be. The second criterion surrounds the calibration in the large. To calculate the sample size, it gives a narrow width for the confidence interval around calibration in the large. We, uh, we rearrange the formula for the standard error. And this simply comes from the formula for the standard error of the intercept term in a linear regression model, as this is essentially what calibration in the large measures. The only things we need to specify here are the variance of the outcome in the external validation data, the anticipated R squared for calibration in the large, and the level of precision that we think is acceptable. A sensible starting point is to assume that calibration in the large equals zero, and so R squared calibration in the large is equal to R squared val, which we defined from the previous criterion. Although, as this will not always be the case, testing a range of values for R squared calibration in the large is recommended. The third criterion targets a precise estimate of the calibration slope. As the C slope is essentially the slope parameter from a linear regression model, we derive this criterion from the standard error of such a slope. In terms of choosing a value for the C slope, a reasonable starting point is to assume that good calibration um, with a slope of 1 and a 0 intercept in the calibration model, such that R squared cal would equal the adjusted R squared estimate in the model development study. Often on external validation, the calibration slope is actually less than 1 due to over overfitting during model development. Lowering the assumed values of calibration slope in this case would reduce the required sample size. Therefore, an assumed slope of 1 is actually the most conservative. Our final criterion is to ensure precise estimates of the residual variances for our calibration statistics. This is essential because although these residual variances are not direct measures of predicted performance in cells, their estimated values are used towards the parameter estimates and crucially their standard errors. So for sigma squared calibration in the large, we consider a linear regression model with only an intercept term and ensuring that the bounds of the 95% confidence interval for the residual variance has a small multiplicative margin of error around the true value. For precise estimation of sigma squared cal, we just need to adjust the sample size to account for the additional slope parameter. This one's really straightforward because regardless of the clinical context, we always just need 235 participants to fulfil this final criterion. 
I'll now illustrate our sample size proposal using an applied example. Hodder et al developed a prediction model for the natural logarithm of fat-free mass in children and adolescents aged 4 to 15 years, including 10 predictor parameters. For step one, we recommend targeting a confidence interval of width of no more than about 10% around your estimate of r-squared, with a corresponding standard error of at most 0.0255. Hudder quotes an r-squared of 94.8% after optimism adjustment. This is very impressive and it's unlikely to be replicated in the external data, so really it's up to you what you think a reasonable estimate of r-squared will be, as this could depend heavily on the clinical context. If we assume conservatively that the R squared will be about 0.8 in our new data, we can either plug the numbers into the equation from the previous slide, or for round numbers or approximations, we can read off the provided graph, included in the publication's figure 1. Next, to ensure precise estimation of the calibration in the large, first we require the anticipated variance, the outcome values in the target population. Hodder reports the quartile values for fat-free mass in their development data set, so by transforming this to the log kilogram scale and assuming that log fat-free mass values are approximately normally distributed, we can derive an estimate for the variance and the log fat-free mass in the development population. The precision required to estimate calibration in the large needs to be placed in the context of the mean outcome value in the population, and it's likely to be highly dependent on the outcome that you're predicting. So considering the original scale here, an accuracy of approximately plus or minus one kilogram around the estimate seems reasonably precise. Applying the calculation gives a minimum sample size requirement of 45 children with the more conservative estimate of R squared val equals 0.8. This is, of course, assuming that the... Um, Sorry. This is of course assuming that the variance of the outcome is consistent between the data sets. If you expected the variance to be quite different, then you could um, choose any value that you thought was appropriate. To ensure the precise estimate of the calibration slope, we need to choose values for the anticipated C slope in the new data, its standard error, and R squared cal. As mentioned previously, let us assume a good calibration, such as the calibration slope is 1. This is not a wild assumption, as you can see from the calibration plot on internal validation. Calibration looks pretty good. Although, so in this case, r squared cal would equal r squared val, so we can take the value of r squared using the previous steps. Choosing a standard error for the C slope of 0.051 then allows us to target a confidence interval with a width of at most 0.2. Plugging these um, values in gives us a requirement for only 98 children to externally validate our model to give that precision around the calibration slope, depending on what we'd expect our squared cal to be. Assuming we aim to validate this model from Hudder et al in a population similar to the development data, steps 1 to 4 have provided four sample sizes to ensure each of the criteria are met. Based on the largest of these sample sizes, the final minimum sample size required to meet all criteria is 235 participants. This is driven by criterion 4 to target sufficient precision around the variance of the calibration statistics. So in conclusion, we've proposed closed form sample size solutions for studies externally validating a prediction model with a continuous outcome. These aim to ensure the sample size is large enough to precisely estimate key measures of predictive performance and their residual variances of the calibration models. As I've demonstrated, implementation of these closed form sample size solutions is quick and it's transparent. You can also use these same calculations with some rearranging to gauge the expected precision when, ex when um, an existing data set of fixed sample size is already available for use. Further work includes extension to non-continuous outcomes and Kim Snell is presenting this work in a poster here at MemTab 2020. I also stress that here we focused only on statistical measures of accuracy on, on external validation. This should not be used to imply precise estimates of clinical utility or possible impact from using the prediction model in practice. Also, if model updating in the new setting is anticipated, then the sample size needs to meet the criteria described here, as well as those proposed by Riley et al for model development, as model updating is akin to model development. For more detail um, on the derivation and use of these criteria, please see our published paper. And if you're interested, I've also included the references for Hudder et al. paper used in our example and the recommendation for sample size needed at model development to be used alongside these recommendations if you aim to update an existing prediction model. Further guidance on sample size and other aspects of prognosis research is available at prognosisresearch.com. Please do get in touch with us if you have any comments or questions about this work. And thank you very much for listening.